Hi, I'm Tom Willis. Welcome to biology class. If everyone would please open your book and turn to page 366. <laughs> I was going to... the whole look on stage. I used to do some acting. I used to do I used to dabble in a little acting, yeah? Yeah, I played Michael Banks and Mary Poppins. At the casino. Still the biggest crowd they've ever had. Standing room only. People in the projection booth. That's right. <laughs> Okay, so what we're talking about today is uh, something called gel electrophoresis. Here's how gel electrophoresis works. You find some DNA at a crime scene. Dead guy laying on the ground. Look under the dead guy's fingernails and there's some skin cells there. Apparently he scratched his murderer before he was stabbed in the chest. <gasps> Should we reenact it? Scratch. Scratch the murder. So under the fingernails of the victim is the DNA from the murder. What they do is they take that DNA that they find under the fingernails, and they take it to the lab, and they put it through a process called PCR. PCR stands for polymerase chain reaction. And it's a process of making a small amount of DNA into a large amount of DNA. Let me show you how it works. Skipping forward a little bit. What they do is they take the DNA from under the fingernails, and they've, they've got DNA for, off of lots of things. They've got DNA off a cigarette butt that a killer left at the crime scene. Because smoking is bad. They've got DNA off a stamp that was licked by a kidnapper who sent a ransom note to the parents of the victim and they peeled the stamp off and off the back of the stamp they got the DNA of the killer and they caught the guy. That was yeah. sucks. How'd you guys do that? They got muscle out of They've got it off hair left on a victim. They take it from semen from rape victims. They do a vaginal swab and get the, the semen out of the rape victim and catch the guy that way. There's a lot of ways to get DNA. It's very hard to commit a crime without leaving some of your DNA language. Just one hair is all you need. So how do you do this? Shoot them. First, you take whatever little bit of DNA you got from the crime scene, and you amplify it. You multiply it. You make it so you have a lot of DNA. And that's a process called PCR, which stands for Polymerase Chain Reaction. Yeah which it talks about in your book on page 368. Polymerase chain reaction. And here's how it works. You take the DNA that you found at the crime scene and you put it in a test tube. Here's some DNA that we found at the crime scene. Double-stranded, double helix here. And you heat it. And what happens when you heat DNA up is it tears apart in two. Uh, it's got to go to 94 Celsius. Ooh. Good question. And the, the uh, two strands of DNA will tear apart. Then all you got to do is drop in an enzyme called DNA polymerase. Remember that enzyme? Yes, I do. DNA polymerase is the enzyme that copies DNA. And you drop in a bunch of nucleotides, a bunch of A's and T's and C's and G's, the nucleotides that make up DNA. And what DNA polymerase do, it'll take the original DNA that was broken apart, and it'll make two copies of the template strands. So you heat it up, this tears apart. You let DNA polymerase make two copies. That takes about five minutes. Of course, it has to be cool. You, got, you heat it up and it tears apart, then you let it cool, then DNA polymerase will make a copy. And then you do the process all over. You heat it up again, that tears apart, 
DNA polymerase makes a copy. Heat it up again, that tears apart, DNA polymerase makes a copy. You go from one strand of DNA to two, to four, eight, 16, 32, 64, 28, 26, 25, 26, 24, 25, 26, 24, 25, 26, 24, 25, 26, 24, 25, 26, 24, 25, 26, 24, 25, 26, 24, 25, 26, 24, 25, 26, 24, 25, 26, 24, 25, 26, 24, 25, 26, 24, 25, 26, 24, 25, 26, 24, 25, 26, 24, 25, 26, 24, 25, 26, 24, 25, 26, 24, 25, 26, 24, 25, 26, 24, 25, 26, 24, 25, 26, 24, 25, 26, 24, 25, 26, 24, 25, 26, 24, 25, 26, 24, 25, 26, 24, 25, 26, 24, 25, 26, 24, 25, 26, 24, 25, 26, 24, 25, 26, 24, 25, 26, 24, so let's take a look at video footage of the PCR process. By the way, this process was invented only because they found a type of DNA polymerase that could resist high temperatures. You could never do this unless you had DNA polymerase that could resist high temperatures. And you know where they found that? They found it in a bacterium that lives in the hot springs in Yellowstone. And it has DNA polymerase that can resist high temperatures. Isn't go. that cool? How'd they find it? Um, scientists working in Yellowstone said, hey, there shouldn't be anything living in these hot geysers. Oh, Wait, there there is. Yeah. And then the DNA polymerase guys go, does that living thing have any DNA polymerase? We sure would could use some heat resistant DNA polymerase. And the guys in Yellowstone said, yeah, of course it has DNA polymerase if it's alive. Have a copy of DNA, and they said, "Well, we need to get some of that." That's exactly. And they that. saw each other and they high five because <laughs> now they can solve crimes. Okay, you're welcome. Video footage. High five. Enable all. Enable all. Not recommended, but we're gonna do it. Because he's gonna get a virus and what the he's heck? gonna get in trouble. Oh, virus! Yeah. Virus. Try why you can't open your cake drop. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> it probably is. So let's continue on with what you're doing. Yeah, it'll be fine. A segment of DNA can be rapidly copied or amplified thousands of times with a laboratory technique called PCR, or polymerase chain reaction. The DNA of interest is mixed with a heat resistant form of DNA polymerase, the four types of nucleotides, and primers. The primers are synthetic strands of nucleotides which are designed to base pair with the ends of the DNA. The mixture is heated to separate the DNA strands, and then cooled so that the primer binds to one end of the DNA. Now DNA polymerase, beginning at the primer, adds complementary nucleotides along the single-stranded DNA. The DNA sequence has now been doubled. The process is repeated as the mixture is alternately heated and cooled, and the quantity of DNA doubles again and again. Each cycle of heating, cooling, and DNA doubling takes about five minutes. After 20 cycles, there will be 1,048,576 copies of the DNA molecule. This technique has revolutionized molecular biology in such areas as diagnosis of disease, study of genetic disorders, and forensic medicine. Cool, huh? Way cool. Pro. Okay. Whoa, what is that? Whoa. It looks like an egg. <laughs> I don't even know what that is. Virus. <laughs> I knew I should have hit enable all. Uh -oh. End of show. That's right. It's unacceptable. Pro. Great job, Drew. That wasn't my fault. Pro, yeah, may I use the restroom? Yes, go use the restroom, but you're going to miss all of this. Wait, is, this oh, the, is, wait, is that the lab we're doing tomorrow? Yes. Like this, this stuff right here? That's right. Sweet. Now. Sweet. Wait, so we're going to catch here. Sure. criminals? Yes, we're going to catch criminals sure. tomorrow. Uh, please don't do my case. Can we do like Clue, where like one person, we got to figure out who it is? And like Meredith can get murdered? Yeah, you're going to figure <laughs> out who it is. <laughs> okay. Listen. We're not done yet. Let me turn the light on for this. No. I'll murder. So. Oh. Oh. Ow, can you turn on the other side light? Yeah. That's fine. That's cool. You take the, the DNA that you now have hundreds of copies of, and you snip it up into pieces. And I better get my magnets to help explain that. Hold on. Bye, bro. Lock the door. Close it. Close it. It's locked. It's Meredith drama. Huh? Meredith drama. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Hi, Hogan. <laughs> okay. Hi, Pro. Okay. Shut up, Here's ready. a piece of DNA found in a crime scene. Say, so this is DNA from under the guy's fingernails. Okay. In actuality, of course, it's way longer than this. But scientists isolate a piece that is called a. Uh, a uh, variable region, which means it's different for each person. You know, my different my my DNA sequence would be different than your DNA sequence because I look different than you. Y'all hang with me. You gotta understand this. this is for the lab tomorrow. What if your twins have the same DNA? Only identical twins. They have the same DNA. You guys don't know. No, we're not identical. Now. You don't look identical. Listen. Stupid. They take the DNA, the variable region, they copy it millions of times using PCR. So imagine there's millions of these. Then they cut the DNA into pieces with restriction enzymes. We studied the restriction enzymes yesterday. Restriction enzymes look for a sequence. ECOR1 looks for GAATTC. And so this restriction enzyme will cut the DNA. Snip. Snip. Cuts that open. There's another GAATTC down here. GAATTC. Bam. Bam. Now we've cut this one piece into three pieces. Look at that. Now remember, there's millions of copies of this. So. This would be cut, this exact piece would be cut millions of times, and so you would have millions of long pieces and millions of pieces this size. Millions of each fragment. So. Then what you do is you take the cut fragments and you load them into a gel. Kind of gel. Well, it looks like Jello. And I'll pass it around. I made this for the AP Bio class, and we'll do it tomorrow. Please don't touch it, but you can look at it. Drew, don't touch it. Don't touch, touch the gel. Drew, Drew, Drew don't touch, touch it. Drew, don't touch it. He just touched it. <laughs> and what you do is you have to cut holes in the gel. You take your gel and you cut what's called a weld. Pay attention here. You cut a weld down into the gel. And in that weld, you place the DNA fragments. So we're going to take our cut fragments and we're going to put them in our weld. And it'll fill up the weld. My, my first period AP Biology class did it this morning. And then what you do is you apply an electric current to the gel. You put a negatively charged wire on this side and a positively charged wire on this side. That's negatively charged, that's positively charged. And you hook this up to a battery. Let me draw a battery. Let me go ahead and tell you something about DNA. DNA has a negative charge to it. So the DNA that we put in this well has a negative charge. What would happen to that DNA if you put it near a negative wire? It would, it would repel. It would repel. Do it, bro. Yeah. And it would start moving away from the wire. <laughs> and it would actually move through the gel. It moves through the gel very slowly toward the positive wire. The gel is thick. So the pieces move slowly, and it takes a couple of hours running them in a machine. That little blue machine sitting on that table where Graham is. See the blue? That's the machine we'll use. We're doing this tomorrow. And the pieces will move through the gel. Up here, Drew. Pieces will move through the gel. 
and the big pieces will move a short distance, and the little pieces will move a long distance. So you'll end up with what we call bands. Big pieces will move a short distance, little pieces will move a long distance, and after you run this for about an hour, you'll see that. Remember, we had millions of big pieces and millions of little pieces, but all the big pieces are the same size, so they're going to move the same distance. All the small pieces are the same size, so they'll move about the same distance. And that's a DNA fingerprint. So that, that um, process takes a whole, all that just to get one fingerprint? Right? Yes, that's a person's DNA fingerprint. And what the scientists do is they'll take all the suspects. Okay, we got this dead guy. No. It's the janitor. He's dead. Well, Who's a suspect? Mer well, Meredith. Mr. Willis was working late at school that night. He's a suspect. On, so we'll bro. test his DNA. Come on, bro. Mr. Gardner had a fight with him earlier because he didn't empty the trash right. He's a suspect. Miss Bradford. Ms. Bradford was seen yelling at the janitor for not sweeping correctly, so she's a suspect. So you take you take your suspects. Here's what you do. You take a gel, and now this is kind of a side view. I'm going to show you. Listen up here. I'm going to show you an overhead view. So if we look at the gel from overhead, what you actually do is you actually make several wells in the gel. And you take a sample of my DNA and you run it in this one, Mr. Willis. Pro. And you have a sample of Miss Bradford, Miss B, and a sample of Mr. Gardner, Mr. G. And then this is what was found. This is your under the fingernails. This is cr the crime scene DNA. And you take all that and you run a fingerprint of each one of them. Now, let's say this is my DNA. Since my DNA is different than somebody else's DNA, the Eco R1 might cut in a different area. So my DNA, or somebody else's DNA, might only have two pieces instead of three. You see? Depending on where they cut. You could cut a piece of DNA into seven pieces, and then you have seven lines. So, at the crime scene, let's say it looks like this. The DNA fingerprint ends up looking like that. Run Mr. Gardner's DNA. His DNA fingerprint is cut into four pieces and spread out like that. Remember, the small pieces go far, the heavy pieces go short. Ms. Bradford's DNA is just cut into two pieces. It looks like that. Bro, you did it. And Mr. Wilson's DNA is cut. <gasps> dun, dun, dun. Whose Hold DNA on. matches the DNA found in the crime scene? Pro. Mine. Now I have to explain what my DNA is doing under a dead man's fingernails. Say that. What are you going to say? And then I say something like, oh, oh, well, um, hmm. He was scratching. Well, he scratched me earlier in the day when I tried to give him a high five and we missed each other and he went kind of low and he scratched me. <laughs> and then they say, okay, but Mr. Willis, when we interviewed you earlier, you said you hadn't seen the guy in two days. Uh oh. Uh oh. Dun, and dun, I say, dun. well, can I stop my lawyer? <laughs> and so that's how it works. That's how they catch people in these crimes. The DNA evidence is irrefutable. No two people have the same DNA fingerprint. It's always different. Unless you're identical. So, this is, everybody um, come up and take a look at the machine. The AP class has already squirted their DNA into their wells. And you can see it's kind of kind of bluish there. Don't touch it. Just look. Someone touch it. <laughs> Meredith. Stop. Okay. And this is what you'll do Meredith, tomorrow. Don't touch it. I'm not. Why is it here? Sophie. Don't touch it. I'm, I'm just following this. You have to go in. No, I'm following Moss's face. Get that crap out of here. Moss, do the face. Do the face, Moss.
We already have it. Do it. Do the face. Where's the face? Do it. Do the face. You're supposed to look at the camera and do the face. No, no. Okay, go back. Do the face. Everybody get a chance to see it? Where'd he go? Where'd he go? I lost the J. I lost that. Did you film the DNA fingerprint? Yeah. Yeah. Pull the camera over there? I, I raised it and was like, Very good. Should we do it again? Let's do it again. Video footage of DNA fingerprinting. Yeah. Oh, that's the best one. 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 Yeah. Oh, that's the best Did he do the face? Just do it. It's of DNA. They learn to cut them into segments. They use a kind of chemical scissors called restriction enzymes to cut the DNA into fragments. The fragments can then be loaded into tiny wells in a thin agar gel. And then separate it using a weak electrical current. The short of the DNA fragment, the fiber travels across the gel. Under ultraviolet light, the individual pieces of treated DNA glow brightly. Stop it, bro. That is why. You don't click enable all. You don't do enable all. Try that again. I want enable all. Enable all, bro. Try it. Of DNA, they learn to cut them into segments. They use a kind of chemical scissors called restriction enzymes to cut the DNA into fragments. The fragments can then be loaded into tiny wells in a thin agar gel and then separate using a weak electrical current. The shorter the DNA fragment, the farther it travels across the gel. Under ultraviolet light, the individual pieces of treated DNA glow brightly. A technician finds the piece of DNA she wants and carefully cuts it out. Since the mid-1970s, using techniques like these, Biotechnologists have learned to isolate specific fragments of DNA or genes and then transfer them to entirely different plants or animals. They can now combine the most desirable characteristics of two different species into the offspring. That's how they found the insulin gene. They cut it up using restriction enzymes, they separated it in a gel, and then they found which one of those lines would produce insulin if you gave that DNA to some bacteria. And so you can isolate genes using this gel. It's not only for solving crimes. One more video on this. This is better music. It's like James Bond. <laughs> DNA is present at every crime scene, just waiting to tell its secrets. Meredith got murdered. Because DNA is found in each and every part of us, it's more likely to be left behind than fingerprints. Detectives collect DNA from blood, hair, even the saliva left on the back of old postage stamps. Gathered samples are x-rayed and analyzed. The black bands show the pattern of chemicals that make up the rows of an individual's ladder of DNA. This sample was taken from a violent crime scene. And this sample came from a suspect. If the two match, the suspect will most likely become the accused. Unless a sample's contaminated, DNA doesn't lie. Collecting DNA from crime scenes is now standard police procedure and the FBI considers DNA its best crime-solving tool. In 1994, a new software program helped law enforcement agencies share DNA evidence, called CODIS, 
The program compares samples taken from a crime scene with any and all other samples stored in the system. Criminals are turned in by their own genes. When the computer finds a match, it's called a cold hit. Already, CODIS has solved over 300 crimes. This is all thousands now. Unsolved crimes can be reopened with DNA evidence. In 1954, the murder of Marilyn Shepard put her husband, Dr. Sam Shepard, behind bars. Convinced of his father's innocence, Shepard's son pursued the case even after Sam Shepard died. DNA tests proved that Sam Shepard's defense had been the truth. Someone else had entered his home and murdered Marilyn. DNA taken from blood at the crime scene did not match Shepard's or his wife's. Did you ever see the movie The Fugitive with Harrison Ford? Yes. yes. That was about that case. Nuh-uh. Yeah, what? There was this guy, Sam Shepard, he was a doctor. Somebody broke into his house and killed his wife. He found his wife lying there, the police came, the guy had already left, and they arrested him for killing his wife. And he's like, I didn't kill her. And, uh, and they thought he did, and they put him in jail. And uh, he was saying a, a one-armed man killed her. The guy had a fake arm. And they're like, whatever, that's your story, and we're, we're, we're putting you in. So they jailed him. He eventually got let out because the evidence wasn't good enough, so the court system let him out, but he did serve a, a good amount of time. Everything else in the movie The Fugitive was made up about him running on the train and all that stuff. But anyway, um, uh, and then, like 60 years later, they still had the DNA from the crime scene, and they ran it once they invented this technique. And he was, he was right, he didn't kill his wife. They found different DNA, it was different DNA. Was it a one on man? I don't know if it was a one on man. That's what the guy was saying. So they've, they've found, they've used DNA evidence. They've had people that have been jailed for 20 years. And the DNA evidence proved that they didn't do the crime. And that they were let out. And then they did so DNA evidence is a, uh, is, a, is a great tool. We can convict people and we can let people out that are in, in there innocently. Yeah. Well, me and Hannah watch CSI Miami a lot, and yeah. we love that show. And we have it like on our iPads and videos and all that. Exact same show. Um, and they show you specifically what they do, like they zoom in on what you're doing. But I still um don't understand like when they get the DNA, and mm -hmm. if it and if all of the suspects don't match the victim. What do they do next? Then, then they know they know all none of those suspects did it. So then they look for it. Can't solve every crime. They, it can prove some people didn't do it, and then they keep looking for whoever did it. And maybe if they find a guy. But this thing about CODIS, CODIS is a system that they take all the felons mm -hmm. and they take samples of their DNA. All the people that are behind bars, they take some hair from them and a blood sample and run their DNA and get the little DNA fingerprint. Then if they let the guys out, and the guy goes and commits another crime and leaves his DNA around, and they find that DNA, they don't even have to have suspects now. They just run it through the system. If it matches somebody that's already in their system, they'll, they can say, oh, so-and-so did. What if they find someone planted? Yeah. Well, you know, that's probably what the defense of the guy who did it will be, that somebody planted it. But it's harder to prove that somebody planted DNA. Could you get DNA on DNA? That's exactly what, I don't know, were you all alive for the O.J. Simpson case? No. The O.J. Simpson case was a big case in the early 90s kind of where this football player named O.J. Simpson was accused of killing his wife. And they found his blood all over the crime scene. Because um, he, he had been scratched during the attack. Um, well, and they also found the glove of the victim, the, the blood of the victim on gloves that were at O.J. Simpson's house. O.J. Simpson had gloves at his house with blood all over them from the victims. But he didn't do it. But he said he didn't do it because he said the police planted the blood. He said the police took blood from the victim and put them all over his gloves. 
and, and dripping up to the steps of his house, and it was all over the place. And the, the jury spotted, and they said, okay, that's plausible. Maybe the police did that. And then he tried the glove on. Yeah, he tried. They made him try the gloves on in court, and they didn't, and they didn't fit. Who they shot? Well, they shot from the. They, they shot, but you can see he's trying to put them on. He's got his hand like this. I think he really did it. Most people do think he did it, but uh, you know, who, who knows? We'll never know. He got convicted of something else recently. He got put back in jail. Yeah, I would never. Tell. Yeah, he like, tried. Heaven forbid like, I was going to murder somebody. I wouldn't go to their house. Still night. I'd be like, hey, I'm going to turn it up. He's not a very good guy. But anyway, introduce yourself. So, your homework is 13.1 and 13.2. You should have read. We do a lab tomorrow. Monday, we have biography. Tuesday is your test. Is there anybody who can make a test like Wednesday? Because I, I have a big history thing on Tuesday. What history thing? We have like four essays to write in two hours. Why? That's not well, we have a history test Monday, and then a two-hour essay test on Tuesday. So Wednesday you don't have anything? Yes, sir. No. We can start the next section on Tuesday and then have to test Wednesday. No, that'd be, no, that'd be awesome. Yeah, Sophie doesn't want that. That'd be awesome. Well, then just